Well, I want to welcome everybody to a, a, a slight change of version. I'm sorry, Steve. I, I'll try and be quiet. I'll, I'll hold it down. <laughs> uh, the return for one night, as of now, of Autosport. I thank all of you that have come out here. Uh, I want you to know that we are uh, in attendance are two Hall of Famers. One I mentioned earlier, but some of you weren't here, but uh, Sprint Car Hall of Famer Eldon Rasmussen is here. And the guy that uh, spent most of his career reading off a teleprompter, but he managed to get into the Hall of Fame as a broadcaster and a uh, teleprompter reader, Howdy Bell is here. Um, I have to thank, there's a young lady here who has spent the last week celebrating the 30-something anniversary of her 21st birthday. It's been going on a week. Nina Ray is here. I'm glad that you were able to get away from the party. <laughs> um, I hope you, if you haven't been to McGilvery's, I hope you have noticed the dramatic changes that have been gone on here. Uh, the place is really something, and of course, one of the most important to a lot of people, no smoking. And as a result, Lance is here. He hadn't been here in two years, now he's back. Um, and I want to thank, I hope some of you have watched our Zoom uh, broadcasts or recordings. And I want to thank Bill and Stephanie Throckmorton for the use of the Grand King uh, shops to do that from. And uh, hopefully they'll be here, maybe we'll talk to them as well. But we're here for at least tonight, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. And I thought, what could I do better than to, I want to, you know, want to talk about racing. People can talk amongst each other what you've been doing. I want to talk about racing, obviously. And uh, things have been going well, and I thought, who would be the best that I could get to come in here, if I paid him, that is. Uh, who better than the voice of the Indianapolis 500? He agreed, silly, to come in here, and please welcome Mr. Mark James. Thanks, Don. Happy to be here. Welcome back for sure. Well, in the absence of uh, things going on, you went to Germany. Yeah, my, uh, my wife, uh, her family is uh, from Germany, has a lot of uh, aunts and uncles and cousins there. And um, taking a page out of your book, I don't travel anywhere where I don't know someone where I can stay for free. Good plan. You know, so uh, we, we, we basically, we were out the airfare and um, we landed in uh, Stuttgart and stayed about 50 miles from there. and. Uh, <laughs> Had a chance as a, a guy that does what I do. Uh, the first thing I did was find a racetrack, so we went to the uh, the Hockenheim Ring, spent the day there, and actually got to take a lap around it, and um, that was really cool. So uh, yeah, 12, 12 glorious days in uh, in Germany for sure. We we enjoyed it. Are you happy to be back and on the air? Yeah, I think so for sure. I I, I think what I'm most happy about this year uh, clearly is is being joined by by fans at, at all of the venues and all of the events. I mean, um, you know, I'm I'm very thankful that that we were able to have a, a, a 20 a 20 season. Um, you know, sad that fans couldn't be there to enjoy it uh, at each and every venue. But um, you know, I I. I'm happy that things had gotten to the point to where fans could return, and, and, and certainly, um, you know, we could talk more about this as, as time permits, but um, I don't think the, the best Hollywood script writers in the world could have come up with a, a better scenario than the one that unfolded in May at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, for sure. I think you're absolutely right. It was a spectacular event. Um, as a broadcaster, you get to watch all the races, you have the connections to get, you know, like I do, I watch on, on Peacock now, and I see something, I'll call somebody, what was that about, and I can get an answer. What, what's been the most interesting during this season that you've seen? I think the variety of winners that we've had, and uh, at this point, uh, how, uh, uh, you know, the, the championship is far from resolved, and there's, you know, certainly four drivers that have a legitimate shot at it. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I like the fact that there's, uh, a bit of a blend of the uh, the the new guard and the old guard, if you will. Not suggesting that Joseph Newgarden is by any stretch the old guard, but I mean he's a veteran for sure. 
Uh, but then you look at as accomplished as Scott Dixon is as a champion. Can't forget Marcus Erickson. You could almost say it's you know it's a it's a it's a five guy battle. Um, although I think he has to have some help from those in front of him in terms of off nights. But uh, uh, to, to to see what uh, what Padua Ward and, and Renus VK have done over the course of the season is. Uh, has been a lot of fun to watch, and some of the other young drivers too, and newcomers to the series. But uh, I, I don't, I don't look at, at, I don't look at it as we've got young drivers that are, are are pushing, you know, the older drivers out of the way. I, I look at it as just simply adding a lot of talented depth to an already talented field, and I, that's what's been fun about it. Well, I, I had a, just a brief chat with uh, Romain Grosjean, and his take, what he said was that he, he enjoys, he can drive these cars. Where in Formula One, they got yeah. uh, traction control and they got so much downforce, all you do is turn it and you hope you turn it to the right place. He's loving driving these cars in a competition. It's something he wasn't really a part of. He was back in the mid-pack and beyond, and it's, it's not the same as running up front. Yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of things have made him a fan favorite. I think, you know, when you go back and... And uh, you think about the way he literally stared death in the face in, in, in Formula One, and then uh, you know you see what he did at Detroit when the car was on fire. He ran over the course marshal, trying to get a fire extinguisher, and was going to try to put it out. Uh, given what he had been through before with that, uh, didn't didn't shy away from it. And uh, you know, as as I told you earlier, I, I don't think two years ago when he was running Formula One, if if someone would have looked into a crystal ball and told him, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bet you any amount of money that in, within a couple of years you're going to be driving an RV around the Midwest with your family and racing an Indy car, he'd have taken that bet. But that's exactly what he's doing, and he's embraced it wholly, and uh, he's been a fine addition to the series in terms of uh, uh, just his personality, his infectious smile, and, and, and he's a pretty darn talented race car driver too. Well, I think it's amazing what he's done coming here with, you know, not seeing the tracks and, and having yeah. little practice. But you got to look at a guy like uh, a young man like uh, Colton Herta. It seems nothing, even his dad telling him what to do, doesn't seem to phase him. He doesn't get excited. He doesn't get mad if something happens. And go on to the next one. Well, I I I think he's. If anyone's going to take over the uh, the uh, the moniker of the Ice Man from Scott Dixon, it'll be Colton Herta. I mean, I, I don't think anything shakes the kid, and he's had plenty to be shaken about, you know, off and on in terms of the bad luck that's bitten him from time to time, just like you know, what happened to him the other night at uh, Worldwide Technology Raceway. But, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's as cool as, as, as a cucumber. I mean, he, uh, when he gets in the car, I mean, he's all business, and, and he'll throw it around, uh, you know, as, as, as wickedly as anyone does. But uh, he's, he's pretty level-headed, pretty cool for sure. Yeah, he's made some passes. Even Paul Tracy said, holy smoke. Right, yeah. And yeah. he's done it, and he's done it well. well and, Paul uh, did that because he did it without hitting anyone. That's what Paul was surprised yeah. about. <laughs> that's what I find interesting yeah. about yeah. Paul. There's a bump, and he said, well, I used to do that. That's yeah. just racing in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, with the addition of uh, Marcus Erickson and Felix Rehnquist and uh, Romain uh, Roman, that the uh, interest in Europe has picked up so that the series is getting ex worldwide exposure. Yeah, I mean, Kevin Magnuson, you know, gave it a shot earlier this year at, uh, at Road America and has expressed perhaps the desire to, to do some more moving forward. And there's been some other Formula One drivers make appearances at the Speedway and at various racetracks. And, and I, I just think the overall feel of the paddock and the camaraderie exists, uh, that exists among the drivers, and I think the relationships that these drivers can develop with the fans, I think, is, is huge in that regard. And, and you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to succeed, a lot of pressure to win. Uh, but uh, I, I, I heard a comparison made, you know, be, between a couple of different series that, you know, Formula One could be more of a grind and, and, and certainly NASCAR can be more of a grind. And, and those guys love it. It's what they sign up for. But, uh, you know, the, it, it, there is still pressure in the NTT IndyCar series to perform, but uh, uh, it's a different kind of pressure and it's one that drivers seem to be able to, once they experience it, they, they want to, they, they want to keep doing it over and over again. They like the schedule because it gives them an opportunity to do other things. And, uh, you know, it uh, gives them, you know, a, a little bit more family time. And uh, there's, there's a lot of plus sides to being involved in the series for sure. Uh, I have heard, and I don't know if it's true, but I have heard that uh, California could shut down. And the two races out there, Laguna Seca and Long Beach, might either, 
might be moved, and I had heard that they might be moved here. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, no, I, and, and again, uh, you know, those, what's unfortunate for the NTT IndyCar Series is, uh, and, and those race officials, uh, those partners at, at Laguna Seca and, and uh, the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach, is, those decisions are totally out of their hands. You know, um, and they would love for those decisions to be made as, as quickly as possible if they're going to be made. But um, uh, when they are made, it, it'll be at the behest of, of, of their county and state and, and maybe, you know, in conjunction with federal health officials, just like all of these decisions have been made. And uh, it'd be unfortunate. I mean, I, I can't imagine, you know, uh, what those promoters have been through not being able to race for the past couple of years. And uh, uh, certainly the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach is, uh, it, there's a lot of history and tradition there and, and hopefully we will be able to, uh, to run that race. You know, it's, it's interesting the following that the series has built up. Um, you know, people, I mean, I get emails and stuff constantly. Geez, I didn't realize that IndyCar was that close to racing and it was that competitive. I've been trying to tell you that for 30 years. Yeah. But this year, I think, is, is probably one of the uh, best competitive, most competitive years in, in quite some time. When you take a guy like Elio, who's, what, 46, I think, or something like that, the knowledge that he has, and I did an interview with uh, Mike Shank, and I, he said, I had no idea what in the world he was doing for the first 150 laps. I'm thinking, what, in, what are you up to? But the last 50 laps, I saw what he was doing. And I figured out what he was doing, and he said he won that with experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no question. I, I I go back to his comments uh, uh, that he made, you know, in the, in the post race uh, after Carb Day. He said, uh, you know, they parked the car and, and started to take it back to the garage, and they said, uh, "What do you want us to do to it?" He said, "Nothing. Leave it alone. Don't touch a thing. It's fine the way it is." He said, "I've got a shot to win on Sunday if you'll just leave it alone." And he said, "So we left it alone." And he was right. And that's you know that's where his years of experience. Uh, came into play but uh, I, I you know that story obviously was was special for me I've, I've had the privilege to be able to call all four three of them were in turn three and 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 this one is as the anchor um, but um, I, I think because at one point he wondered if you know he would ever have simply another shot to win it um, and and then to get that shot and come back and and win it and, and I for those of you that that don't know um, I can tell you I've seen two too many times evidence of it. What you see is what you get. There is nothing that's turned on for the camera. He is as genuine as uh, genuine can be, and um, it's it's easy uh, to, to root for him. And I know you're supposed to be um, in, in, impartial as a member of the media, but I'll, I'll admit to getting choked up when he crossed the outer bricks for sure, because he, he deserved that. He really did. He earned it. And he, and he brought to, to the table, and he said that Mike Shank said, you come, we'll give you a car to win. He said, by golly, you did. Yeah, that's for sure. And I, and I mean, that's that's the thing. And, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any question, either he or Juan Montoya, I don't think we're, we're ready to openly embrace uh, stepping away from open wheel full time. But that's, that's at the time, that was the opportunity that gave them a chance to come back and, and run the Indianapolis 500 and be with a team that gives them a chance to win. And so um, I, I think uh, Elio with... His background and, and being a three-time winner, I, I think it was the ultimate compliment to that race team that he had enough faith in them uh, to join forces with them. And um, I, that's that's a great story. If you don't know much about it, look it up. I mean, you you think about a group of guys that started out the first year or so with just a handful of races, and then you know had the patience uh, to grow it at a pace that made sense, and then the technical alliance with Andretti Autosport and and then to be full-time and, and, and now get to the point to where they're growing to, you know, two cars full-time in the series. I, 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 I hope that they're awfully proud of what they've done because they've done, it's a cool story for sure. Well, I interviewed Mike Shank uh, at the Grand Prix. Now, the video is up. If you haven't watched, we've been doing Zoom since we shut down here a year ago, February, I think. They're there. I did a thing with Mike Shank, and what a class guy he yeah, is. Yeah, he is for sure. And I said, has this changed anything in your business? He said, are you kidding? I said, did you, did you expect this response? Not a chance. Yeah, for sure. He said, boy, oh boy. If people don't think that this is a business, <laughs> he said, I do the business. I got the crew to run the cars, but I do the business. And he, and he told me that his 
early years he did drive some, but he got into sports car. He said that's what paid the bills. Yeah. And we we got along well, and then we were able to expand and come up here. And I said, was your goal to get to? In yeah, that was one of my goals. And I said, I th to me, you've you've done it right. You you didn't run, you walked, and you made it along. Right. Now he's ready for he needs two cars. Yeah, they didn't rush it along for sure. No. What do you think about the announcement by Hyvee that uh, that Iowa's back in the picture? Well, I, I think uh, it's it's the ultimate compliment to the series, but I think it's also a huge compliment. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I know that maybe he hasn't won as many races as people thought he should have won, and he's come close to winning championships a couple of times, but I, I give a lot of credit for that sponsorship and, and the way they've stepped their game up uh, to, to Graham Rahal and what he does for sponsors. I mean, he's about as active and as passionate as, as any driver in the series when it comes to supporting sponsors. I, I mean, I, he kept sticking and shake a float for quite a while, I think, when, when that sponsorship was on that card. It was unfortunate that, you know, it, it eventually went away. But, uh, you know, all of, the, um, all of the work that he does for charity and how he ties that into his race team and uh, the fact that he's a, he's a proud American and a supporter of, of uh, the country and, and, and troops and, and again, uh, is a, a, a tireless supporter of all of his sponsors, I think. He impressed the people from High V, and I, I think they've been impressed with what they see, with what the, I, I, I think fans responding to those sponsorships. I, I think is what helped drive that and 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 made that deal come together. And he's to be commended for that. I think. Well, I was in uh, Western Illinois this weekend to visit my daughter and some grandkids, and I hate to say I'm old enough that I've got a number of great grandkids, but there's a High V store there, and I went in just to walk around. You'd be surprised the. Workers wear IV yeah. uh, IndyCar shirts. There's yep. stuff up on the wall for IndyCar. The, uh, the, I think the CEO of the company said they got 89,000 employees. I didn't realize it was that big. And you know what they've done. Now I talked to uh, uh, Graham at the GP. And I said, I see something popping up about a car dealer. He said, oh yeah. He said, I've been doing that since I was 17. I, you know, I get a yeah. car, I'd fix it up. He's got a shop over here in Brownsburg. He said he does very well. Right. He's got quite a crew. I think he told me there's 15 people that work for him. Yeah, him and his dad both have a pretty good business acumen. There's no question. And, uh, you know, congratulations to them. And uh, going to be interesting to see what that driver lineup looks like next year. I mean, there's there's going to be three for sure. But uh, I, I, I think there's only one that we can guarantee will be a part of that race team at I, this point. I, I, there's one I don't foresee moving on, but uh, the other two so. could be up in the air at best. So. And, and Mike Shank said that uh, by Long Beach he will announce his second yeah. driver. I, was, I have to say I was sorry to see uh, Jack Harvey move on, but the story I was told, and I asked if it was true, and yes, that they had a contract and he was there and he decided I guess he's got a better offer, so he turned because they wanted him right and he's had another opportunity and he's moving on and good for him because he's done well he's a heck of a good driver well, they, they, they admitted that there's a level of discomfort associated with what they're trying to do every weekend now knowing that he's moving on and you know I, I, I know that uh, there's a lot of speculation as to where he's going but make no mistake about it when he made his decision not to go back to Meyer Shank he, he knows exactly where he's going but I'll I'll give him credit. He's he's very tight-lipped. He hasn't told a lot of people. I I don't know if anyone knows maybe other than him because it would have gotten out by now I think and been confirmed. But it's. Well, I asked know. him if he had another seat when I saw him again at the GP and he said, Yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, I I don't suppose you'll tell me. He said, You suppose you're right. <laughs> Doesn't hurt to ask though, right? Oh. <laughs> maybe you'll get the scoop. You never can tell. Um, you know, I th I think it's interesting that uh, and as I said, I did my program since last February, a year, and a year and a half or whatever it is from the Grand King Race Shops, where is, is now the shop for their Top Gun uh, racing, and they work on the car there. It's, it's garage there. Um, and I think what they're doing is a slow walk, again, like Mike Shank. Uh, they missed the 500. They qualified it at the Grand Prix, and the kid can run a car. They know that. Right. You know that he doesn't have a problem, but they had a failure of a piece of equipment, and they only got five laps at the Grand Prix. But they're they're building their second car right now, and uh, I think they're supposedly to be here. But they're meeting with a potential sponsor and so forth. Um, so they're looking to grow and go full time. There's added cars next year. 
uh, there's, I think, another team or two that is looking to come in. So the series is growing, obviously. And uh, I, th I think it's going it, to, in my opinion, it's the greatest open wheel series in the world. Far better to me than Formula One because these guys got to drive the car yep. and race the car. And it's very close. Whereas in Formula One, they're one of three or four cars that be on the pole and the rest of them are just there. I think what was huge for the series was, uh, you know, that, that NBC made the announcement uh, that uh, they're going to extend their deal. Because, I, I mean, let's be honest, uh, you, you know, a big part of the success that you have in retaining sponsors or attracting new sponsors is they want to know what kind of exposure they're going to get. And I think with the, the commitment level raised in terms of races being on network television, um, I, I think that went a long way toward, uh, you know, getting people maybe uh, off center a little bit and swinging the pendulum uh, toward the series. But, but I also think the fact that the success that we're having in terms of the parity, um, there, there's, you know, even though Chip has three of the top five in points, I, I, I think there's, there's um, the idea that literally – Anyone, 1 through 24, 25, has an opportunity to win and, most weekends. And, and has. has. And, and, has yeah. and has, for sure. And, and so I, I, I think that, that gives teams an opportunity to, to maybe attract sponsors. And, and it's changed. I think, you know, it, it's nice to be willpower and have Verizon on your car every weekend. But I, I point to Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan Racing, too, as, as one of those teams that has found success in having regional sponsors. I mean, uh, whatever's on the car depends on... Uh, who's, you know, where they are on the schedule at that particular time. And there have been, you know, like the doubleheader weekend in Detroit, thanks to technology that exists with wrapping cars now, that they can actually turn a car over from Saturday to Sunday with a totally different sponsor. And so that's beneficial to teams too. So, you know, there, there are many factors that, you know, uh, go into, I think, to it, but there's still a tremendous amount of the business side of it that we probably don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But also the numbers of, of, of viewership has grown yeah. immensely and people getting involved. I mean, I get emails constantly. I get eight, sometimes 800 emails asking questions that I don't have the answer to. And if you've watched any of our Zoom, I bring people in that can answer the questions. Uh, I, as I say, I've only had two drivers, but I've talked to all kinds of people about, you know, what makes a series tick and who makes the series tick and who does the work? So, yep. um, you know, another thing that I that I think is really helpful and is working out extremely well is the Road to Indy program. Uh, the, the, the number of drivers that have come through there that are now into IndyCar is quite a, quite astounding. If you don't really look at who's there and how they got there. Yeah, and over the past few years, I think you know we we've extended it all the way back to karting. And I mean, you can from a from the very first time a kid gets into a go kart, you can chart a clear path that lands him in the NTT IndyCar series. And you know, the scholarship program I think is has been huge in that regard. And and I think we've probably reached a point to where uh, that scholarship for uh, the Indy Lights presented by Cooper Tire is probably more important than it has ever been because. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of talented veterans out there and uh, vying for seats in in race cars, and you know that 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 may limit you know a, a guy that finishes second or third in points in Indy Lights, even though he might be ready, there might not be an opportunity for him in IndyCar because of of some of the veterans that are vying for seats and. And, and, and I do think another element of that formula that makes it attractive is if you, you come up your first year and you don't win the championship, I, I think it's still a good idea to run second and in some cases maybe a third year in Indy Lights and, and take a shot at that championship and use that, that money to, to get to the top run. Well, I saw in the release they had today that the winner of USF 2000 gets a half a million to move up. If you win the uh, Pro 2000, you get 700 and some thousand. Yep. And if you win Indy Lights, you get a million, slightly more than a million dollars to move up. So yep. it's there to be able to move. The question is, who's going to move out of a seat you can get into? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that, you know, I mean, that, they'll, they'll be room for some, there'll be room somewhere for someone with that kind of money for sure. And that's what it's designed to do is create opportunities for them, which is great. And yeah, I mean, if you look up and down our roster, uh, you know, for an NTT IndyCar Series race, the overwhelming majority of those drivers are drivers that we've watched come up through that very ladder, and that's that's the cool part about that program for sure. And I think, uh, I, I know there's a young man, David Malukas, who is doing really well. He won again uh, 
this weekend, last weekend, I think. And he's got a backer that's ready to back him to go, so he yeah. doesn't have to go look for money. He's got it. Yeah. And of course, somebody's going to say, "Come and see me." <laughs> yeah, Kyle Kirkwood, I think those two are battling too. it out for the championship, and he's another kid that people kind of label this can't miss, you know, and a, a likable kid with a lot of talent for sure. Yeah, it's interesting to watch. The only thing I'm upset about is I have Peacock, and they don't show that anymore. On gold, they did, but now they don't, and I'm not happy. It's always on IndyCar Radio, Don. Oh, I know. I listen to you. You'll never I, miss it. If you I lock listen, it to IndyCar Radio, you'll never miss it. You'll I know right where it you. is every time. I listen. <laughs> How many listen to Mark during the broadcast of the races? <laughs> See, I told you there's four. <laughs> That's right. Hey, what happened to WIBC? Where are you now? Uh, well, we're on their two FM channels. Don't get me started on that. Oh. Well, you had nothing to do with it. No, I didn't. And uh, I feel sorry for JMV. I mean, he is uh, their their afternoon drive uh, uh, show host. He has he has basically had to to ward off uh, all the complaints and frustrations of people that aren't able to hear what is essentially where our network was born and where it began. And uh, it was a business decision, albeit an unpopular one, clearly, but um, business nonetheless. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still happy with our relationship with our friends from MS Communications, but uh, we're unfortunate that the 1070 legendary signal is, is now dark. So. Yeah, but there is an advantage to not being there. Now I can go farther outside of town and hear you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, it, I don't go, but I have. I, it was just a little frustrating to me because I was driving home the other night from a from a uh, my son is coaching at Speedway High School. He's their defensive coordinator, and I we was were driving get home. To that. I we was were driving get to home that. from from their game, and you know, depending on where you are, you have to go from 107.5 to 93.5. You can't you can't leave it there. But uh, you know that that. That, that's another way in which they're driving you to their app on the phone, I guess. If you, if you listen to it on your phone, you'll, you'll always get it. But I, I, I prefer radio for obvious reasons. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, so do I, because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> now, let's, I was going to bring that up, but you, you beat me to it. You, your son has uh, played ball under your guidance in high school in yeah. Monrovia, and yeah. obviously with, with the teaching from you, and he did play in college, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, Mount St. Joe's. Yeah, and then now he is the defensive coordinator for Speedway. And Speedway, I, I'm not sure how they've done so far, but they've had a powerhouse the last few years. So. They've had some good players for sure. Uh, a lot of talent there. The Pelly family, uh, really good. And Steve Ray took over for him. And then, you know, in the last two years, my son was teaching at Avon Middle School West and coaching at Zionsville and was on their staff that went to a a state championship game last year and he wanted he lives out in Chapel Glen he wanted to get a little closer to uh, to home and um, and so he initially had taken a coaching position at Ben Davis but then uh, Avon decided to uh, consolidate some of their bus routes and they were going to dismiss his school at 420 in the afternoon and that that really puts a damper on your coaching career so fortunately uh, Speedway Middle School was uh, was was looking for a social studies teacher and uh, they had hired a, a new head coach, Shane Clampett, who, you know, is a, a Speedway lifer. And, um, you know, he was able to get not only hired at the middle school, but hired by Coach Clampett. And uh, they started their season with a win last Friday over, over Covenant Christian. And he is a much better coach and much smarter than his old man ever was, for sure. So, <laughs> Well, I don't know. His old man has made... A couple of moves I can think of. One of them sitting over there yeah, in the that's booth. Right. That's right. You did well. How, how is the uh, uh, radio network doing? Is the coverage as it used to be four, three, four hundred stations? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going well, and um, you know, the, it, technology again, I think, has only expanded our audience. I mean, we're uh, we appreciate the uh, the the increased exposure we get on Sirius and XM, uh, Sirius XM. They they. They literally carry everything we do now. For a while, it was only the races, but now it's all the Indy Lights practices and qualifying and races and all the IndyCar practice and qualifying and races. Um, and we, we appreciate that. We have that TuneIn app, which is one of my favorites because when we're not on the air, you might, you might get the 1958 500, and then after that, you'll get the 1965 500, or you might get the 
you know, 2011 Indy 500. So uh, that's really cool. And then, you know, we're on IndyCarRadio.com and, and on Race Control on IndyCar.com. So it's a little difficult, I think, to, to measure the total audience because we're on so very many platforms, but it's easier to get now than it has ever been, and we're, we're very, very proud of that. We, we had to make some additions to our staff this year. Uh, Rob Howden was not able to be with us for the Indy 500. Uh, Dave first sold out for more money with Penske Entertainment. I can't believe he would rather be the vice president of communications for Penske Entertainment than be a pit reporter for IndyCar Radio, but Dave's selfish like that. Um, so uh, we replaced it with Scott Sander, who's uh, a, a longtime uh, television veteran, uh, anchors mornings on Wish TV, and, um, and, and, and Alex Wolf, a young man who works for WIMA in Lima, Ohio. And I'll tell you how I knew that they were the right hires. They never one time asked how much it paid because it just oh. it just didn't matter. They just wanted to be a part of it, and were honored and privileged to do it. And and then they did a, a tremendous job. And I was happy for both of them that they could come on board with us this year. I just found out something today that there's a photographer that's in love with uh, racing. He does do photography, and I'm not sure. I know he was at the speedway, and I heard his name. I saw his name today. I thought. I recognize that name, but I'm not sure. Then I was told it's Kenny Moore. He plays for the Colts. Oh, yeah. And they said yeah. he's a huge race fan. Yeah, for sure. Well, if I could pry him away from uh, wherever they're practicing or get him on a weeknight, I'm going to do a Zoom thing with him. Talk about his love for the sport. Don't because schedule one for Sunday. No, I, I've, I've heard that's not a good day. He may not answer you. That's what I'm afraid yeah. of. He might not answer me anyway. And say, oh. I just like to see by a show of hands how many people are fascinated by the fact that Don K and Zoom are used in the same sentence. How about that? <laughs> Who would have thought it? My goodness, congratulations. Welcome to this century, my friend. Happy to have you here. <laughs> well, I might as well embarrass myself and say I don't really do much other than set everything up. Um, here's one of the people from Speedway Cable that helps out. We do the program. They say it's done. They send it off. It gets edited, send it back, and put it up. But I sit there and I put everything to, in yeah. place. And when somebody said, when I said, now what are we going to do? He said, why don't you do Zoom? I thought of that commercial where the kid says, Zoom, Zoom. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> I had no clue. What's Zoom? Well, now we're doing it for a year and a, about a year and eight months. Well, I, I will say that uh, I, I'm obviously overjoyed to be a part of your first show back here at McGilvery's. And, uh, uh, and all the years that you and I have known one another and all the guests that you have done, I'm still not quite sure how in the hell you got the governor to come on this show with you. <laughs> and you did it without starting an international incident. That, I think that's what I'm most proud of. Well done. Uh, I, 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 I was impressed. Uh, I tried to call his former scheduler, and he's gone, and, and his new scheduler's name is Sam Frain, so I thought, he's got to be related to Andy Frain Ushers in Chicago. Well, he's not, but uh, he, he, I told him what I wanted, what I wanted to do, what I wanted. I said, it's not political. I don't want to get into politics. Yeah. It's racing. He got back to me the next day and said, the governor said, Don, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Well, I, I'm telling you, politics aside, I, I, I don't get into that debate, but I, I know this. He's a Hoosier, and he's a proud Hoosier. And uh, I've enjoyed visiting with him every year at, uh, at the state finals. And uh, uh, for basketball, I see him there. And, of course, every year he comes to the booth for the 500. And, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to share that booth with, with him or whomever the governor is. But, uh, but no, I'm well done on that. That was, that was a cool interview you did with the governor, for sure. He's a good he's, guy. He's good. He is a good guy. And, of yep. course, the fact that he's from Claremont, and was a classmate with Mike Red uh, Devil. Yeah, he's a classmate with uh, um, T Tim Sindrick. Yep. I th that connection, of course, and they're still good friends. So, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, he, and he loves it. So, you played basketball. You can't walk. What are you talking about? I know, I know. But he, you know, he, he couldn't jump that good. He said he couldn't jump over a dime. <laughs> but he can shoot. Yeah. What do you see going forward for IndyCar? Do you, do you, you know, what, what do you see is going to happen? Do you think uh, Rojan will stick around for a few years? Do you think Erickson, you think uh, Elio will stick around for another couple of years? 
Yeah, I, I, I don't see why not. I mean, uh, uh, Dale Coyne, you know, made it very clear to us when we talked to him at Worldwide Technology Raceway last weekend that, um, you know, he said, uh, don't believe all the rumors. He said, I'm, I'm doing all I can to keep him. I mean, we want to keep him. We, we like the team, and he likes us, and um, it's it's not a done deal yet. I mean, there's there's every intent to, to, to keep him in the fold, and um, we'll see if he, if he does. Um, be interesting to see what the first domino is that falls in terms of you know where where those available seats are. I mean, Michael didn't waste any time halfway through the season. Michael Andretti kind of indicated that there's certainly going to be uh, changes there. Ryan Hunter Ray confirmed that it, this was the plan all along for this to be his his last season. And and with him, I you know I, I either the DHL sponsorship follows him or or stays with Andretti and they embrace another driver because. Uh, that's one of those that's that's long standing now, and and it's nice to drive around town and see those those Indy cars on their trucks, and uh, I hope that relationship continues for sure. So, uh, I I think uh, the uncertainty of all of that and the talented drivers that still don't have a home yet is, is another indication of how competitive it is, which is a good thing, um, and. Um, you know, I, I think having the, the television contract solidified for the foreseeable future and a firm commitment to network television is healthy. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the growth will, con will continue. Happy to see that Iowa's back for two races. I, I hope at some point that somehow, some way, guys smarter than me, which aren't that hard to find, uh, <laughs> can, can find a way to maybe tweak that short oval arrow package to make those races a little more compelling and a little more entertaining, uh, but certainly do it uh, so they can race safely. But um, I, I, I think for all intents and purposes, it's, it seems to be going in the right direction. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to be a part of it, for sure. You know, the interesting thing I find is most of these guys, and you got to admit, a lot of them came here from road racing to start with. And when they, we had a couple of drivers that came at the team I was working on, I said, you ever driven an oval? No. Are you concerned? Yeah. But once they got into it, they like it. They love it. And they've all said, we're glad to go back to Iowa. They like racing the yeah. short ovals. What I'm disappointed in, they had a race schedule for uh, Richmond, where you and I, the last race we were there, I was up with you broadcasting, and I'm sitting there watching, cleverly. And th the grandstands were filling. And I said to you, if this keeps up, we're going to have to find another place to sit. Right. And they canceled it. Yeah. And they were supposed to run last year and didn't, but they didn't come back this year. Now, Roger made the point that he wants more ovals in the series. Yeah. I sure hope they go back to Richmond. That was a great place. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it, too. And I think if I remember right at the time when, when that race went away, the, the first time was, was because, you know, their inability to, to find another title sponsor. I think it was SunTrust maybe is who they had before, and they lost them and couldn't secure another one. And, and, and I get that. That's the business side of it. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with not being faced with a huge gap in the schedule next year, uh, thanks to the Olympics, uh, there's, a, there's a hole there that needed to be filled. And, and uh, who knows if, if another racetrack will, will help fill that void. But um, happy about the fact that, you know, not only do you get a race in Iowa, but quite frankly, in terms of a setup, it could present a lot of challenges for the drivers and the teams because i I got a sneaking suspicion that track will – drive and feel a bit differently on a Sunday afternoon than it'll feel on a Saturday night there. So that, that, could, be, that could be very challenging for them, for sure. Uh, are you still enjoying broadcasting? I mean, the races are competitive enough that you have something to broadcast instead of somebody running away with your, and in, in the lead is. Well, and, and, and the, the advantage that we have uh, with what we do is that I don't, in, in television, you know, but Lee and, and Townsend and, and Paul, by and large, have a producer in their ear deciding what they're going to, to, to see and what they're going to call and when they're going to call it. Uh, that That's up to me. I mean, if, uh, you know, we, we have someone who's jumped out to a, a two and a half to three second lead, um, you know, we can look elsewhere and, and, and find a, a pretty compelling battle for fifth or sixth or, or maybe even for 12th or 13th to give those teams a, a, a little air time and a little publicity and their sponsors and whatnot. So, yeah, from, from that regard, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm surrounded by such incredibly talented people, uh, and um, we uh, are, are all fans first and all have a lot of passion for what we do and how we do it. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we're, 
we're not egotistical because it's an ego-driven business, but I, I, I think our goal is to entertain and inform and um, share our passion and enthusiasm, and uh, hopefully we do a, a better-than-average job of making people feel as though they're at the racetrack. That's our goal anyway. So, yeah, it's still a lot of fun for sure. Well, I've always liked listening to the radio for sports because they have to tell you what's going on yeah, that, for rather sure. than sit there and watch it. <coughs> And, and I, you know, I think Chris has done a good job with uh, providing you with what you need to call the race. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. So, you know, it's fun to listen to. I have you gotten used to being referred to as I introduced you as the uh, voice of the 500. Uh, you know, Paul has pushed Paul Page has pushed me really hard to embrace that. For the longest time, I I I kind of shied away from it a little bit because, um, I mean, that's I I. I was having a hard time connecting to it and, and realizing that it was actually happening and that it had happened. And, you know, I, I look at those that came before me and, and I, you know, you, you know me pretty well. And, and it's, it's still hard. This, is, this was my sixth. And it's, uh, it's hard for me to, to connect to the fact that, that I'm one of six. Um, but um, uh, Paul has pushed me pretty hard to embrace that. And Donald has too. And, um, and uh, certainly... Um, you know, the, uh, the magnitude of it hits me every May. Uh, uh, I will say there's not as much pressure um, if we're calling the race from Long Beach or Barber or, or someplace like that. But um, not only do the butterflies every year come back on, on race day for the 500 uh, like they did my first year as anchor, but uh, I, I would even equate them to my first year as a pit reporter in 1996. And, and I, I can tell you without hesitancy that if I, ever, if I ever start a broadcast of the 500 and I still don't have those butterflies and still don't have those feelings, I think that'll be somebody's way of telling me that it's time for somebody else to do it that feels that way. So. Well, you just got there. You're just a young kid. <laughs> uh, you've got a lot. Look, look at Howdy Bell. He's been around for years. He's learned how to read. Uh, so, you know, and, and for the la he hasn't been there the last two years, so I've been up in the media center trying to figure out where is the Howdy Bell story. I can tell it to you in my sleep, yeah. but, he was, but he wasn't there. Oh, well. Um, you know, the, the broadcasting, I think, is a very important part of, of motorsports, and particularly IndyCar, because that's mostly what I watch and listen to. But um, you know the the way it's handled. How many of you, by the way, just cross? How many of you have read the book? Hello, I'm Paul Page. It's race day in Indianapolis. How many have got the book and read it? Well, you need. Oh, well, Marty has. You need to get it. It's really good. Yeah. I did an interview with him, and it's up on uh, on uh, YouTube at the Speedway mu uh, uh, Museum when he was signing books. And uh, it, did a, it was a nice to talk to him. And the stories that he remembers and, and what, it took him five years to remember them. Uh, but it, it's really an interesting book. If you get a chance to get it, get a copy, it's good. Howdy's name isn't in it, as far as I know. I don't think he could spell it. That was a problem. But anyway, um, are you looking forward to the, the the last three races of the season? Are you are you looking forward to the end of the season, or would you like to have another couple? No, I mean, I, but by the time it, the, the season rolls around, I've, I've, I've typically you know kind of look forward to the end of it. Uh, it is as I mentioned with with what my son does. Um, um, we're 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 pretty heavily invested in in, in high school football on Friday nights and. Uh, you know, I'm back in the classroom teaching uh, communications at Monrovia, and uh, you know, it's it's a little tough to to juggle all of those things at one time. Um, I, I will say that uh, the last couple of years, I've been able to end the season uh, by doing something strictly for fun. Uh, once the IndyCar season is over, two weeks later, uh, Nick Yeoman and I uh, have been honored and privileged to to be invited by the Performance Racing Network, our good friend Doug Rice, and those folks, and. Uh, uh, we go down and, and are part of the broadcast crew that call the Roval uh, at Charlotte. And uh, that, that's a cool event. It's a lot of fun. 
and it's nice, quite frankly, to be able to show up, uh, grab a starting lineup, get my gear, and go out to the back stretch and just call racing, and not have to worry about timing into commercials and breaks and <laughs> and and you know planning the show out and all that stuff. It's just fun to go, you know, go play radio for a couple of hours each day. And those folks are so gracious to us. That's many of the folks that we combine our efforts with, you know, during the Brickyard weekend at the Speedway. And so. Uh, we're happy to have done that for for three years. Look forward to doing that again uh, this year. And and typically, you know, I I you know follow high school college football closely. We spend you know time in Florida during the holidays. But usually, once we get past the new year and get into early February, that's when we start getting the itch again and start looking forward to the start of the season and you know the the open test and. Uh, and uh, you know, every year we there's a there's plenty of anticipation as we get ready to, to to start the season. Now I haven't told you this before, but I ran into a family who son I believe it's his son goes to Monrovia and yeah. he's in one of your classes. Oh, is that right? And he said, "I'm going to tell you something. Do you know Mark?" I said, "Yeah." Don't tell him I said yes, but yeah, I do. He said they, he loves the class. Yeah, that he he loves what he does. He teaches yeah. us, and we know he knows what he's talking about because we can turn the radio on on a lot of weekends, and there he is. Yeah. Thank so you. I, I think uh, it says a lot for what you do and how you do it. And of course, strange as it sounds, the kids like you. Yeah, well, one of my former students who's uh, currently uh, he's just just started his sophomore season at Ball State in their telecommunications program, which is one of the most respected in the country. Um, thanks to uh, Alex Damron and Susie Elliott, and and despite the fact that I was I influenced him when he was in high school, they still <laughs> thought enough of him to hire him, and he worked in the media center this year at IMS, which was a tremendous experience for him, and he's got a very bright future and. Uh, uh, another former Beach Grove student of mine worked for IMS Productions in the TV compound. So that's what's really cool. And, and to me, quite frankly, to, to have that kind of an impact uh, is much more important than anything I do behind a, a microphone in terms of, of helping to influence those young folks and, and, and see them become passionate about the same thing that I'm passionate about, which is broadcasting for sure. Uh, I, I know a lot of you have know who the driver is for Top Gun Racing, R.C. Enerson. His father started a driving school, and it's called uh, Lucas Oil School of Driving, I think, or Racing. I can't remember which. But I, I just asked him the other day about uh, what's it going to be like when your first graduate gets into the professional, gets into the Road to Indy program. He said, are, are you kidding? And I think he's had a couple. I said, your goal then is to have one of your graduates well, join the IndyCar series. He said, when that happens, you'll hear me. Yeah. He lives in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. He said, but trust me, you'll hear me. So it's kind of interesting to be, you know, in a position where you teach these kids and they move on up, yeah. and take what you taught them. And I just, I just don't tell them what it pays. I'll let them figure that out on their own. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we were talking about, uh, and I mentioned earlier, a good friend of yours and mine, uh, Bob Jenkins passed away. And what an effect he had on motorsports. I think he and uh, Benny Parsons really put NASCAR on the map from a broadcasting standpoint. And what always amazed me is he'd come in and he'd say, why are these people here to see me? I'm just a guy. People knew that he was passionate for what he did. He, was, uh, he, he only told you what he knew was true, because as you know, as a broadcaster, if you don't know what you're talking yeah. about, the fan will pick up right now. Right. And he was probably as, uh, one of the most recognizable voices and faces in motorsports television ever. And whenever I'd invite him, he'd always come. I don't know why, but he did. He said, sure. What are we going to talk about? I don't care. We'll think of something, and we'd always think of something to talk about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, again, very, very genuine. And uh, I caught him at a weak moment in 96, and he hired me on the radio <laughs> network. So uh, uh, I, I'll always be eternally grateful for that and, and was not only a friend but a mentor. And, I mean, starting typically in late March, early April, um, I would I would start bouncing ideas off Bob for the pre-race show for the 500. And, um, you know, um, I, I think in terms of, of the people that I work closely with over the years, you know, the, the listener's opinion means a lot and, 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 and for sure it does and, and, and other people. But I, I think the approval of, of Bob and Donald Davidson probably meant the most to me in terms of my time as anchor uh, because they, to me, were, uh, you know, directly connected to the past, certainly Donald to Sid. 
and uh, and Bob goes pretty far back too. But uh, no, I, I I told the story in my tribute to Bob. I said uh, this to me is what summed up Bob Jenkins perfectly. Uh, my wife and I met him for lunch a few years ago at a, a dockside restaurant in Florida, and uh, we we got there before before Bob did and. Um, uh, when, he, when he came walking around the corner, he was wearing a, a, a pair of shorts and a faded T-shirt and, and deck shoes and probably hadn't shaved in four or five days and, and had a, a wonderful Florida tan. And, and here was this motorsports legend. Um, but but uh, it, it, that day he was just Bob, and I, and I think that's what he enjoyed uh, being a great deal. And um, uh, uh, the, the world is a little less kind and a little less humble for sure without him. What something always impressed me was he, as well as Scott, uh, Scott Goodyear, credited Paul Page with teaching them how to broadcast, how to do races. And Bob has said many times that, that Paul taught him you know, how to broadcast a, a motorsports event. And Scott Goodyear has said, and I've repeated this before, that they used to travel back and forth to the racetrack. And Paul would be driving, and all of a sudden he'd start calling the race, and he'd just wait for... Scott to pick it up so he can learn how to pick up and go on. He said, if it wasn't for Paul, that's who taught me how to do that. So, Yeah, the guy who taught me more to motorsports broadcasting was, uh, I, I thought I was a pretty good broadcaster when I joined the network, but the guy that influenced me most heavily in terms of motorsports broadcasting was Gary Lee, no doubt. I mean, Gary, Gary taught me a lot about motorsports broadcasting and, and, and the terminology and how to handle drivers and crew chiefs and things of that nature. And, uh, but uh, there's no question, I, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to be influenced by, by some of the best. And um, um, I, I hope that, that, that we do, do all of them proud each and, each and every time we turn on a microphone, not just in May, but all throughout the course of the year, because that's very, very important to all of us. Well, I probably shouldn't say this because it, it, it won't embarrass you. The number of people that said, "Who you got somebody coming in?" I said, "Yeah, I've got some kid. He's a voice of the 500. Mark Jane's going to be here." I said, "Yeah, we'll be there." I appreciate that. Thank and you very much. I don't know why, but even Howdy got out of bed to come here. <laughs> <laughs> but the best part of that is he brought Cheryl with him, so that worked out well. Well, I don't know about you folks. If anybody has any comments about the season, you're welcome to come up and say something. I want to thank Mark and uh, his lovely bride for coming out on a, what is this, a Tuesday night? I know a Tuesdays are busy for you, I guess. But no, Desiree Tuesday was nights not, typically aren't very busy for me. So. That's what I said. Yeah. But yeah. Desiree said she made you put everything back to Tamar to come today. <laughs> That's right. She, <laughs> she was excited to come out and see you, Don. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she yeah, wanted to get back to the Gilberys for oh, sure. Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. Welcome back. I, I hope you're back next week. I hope you keep doing know. this. This is great. I don't know. I really we'll do. See. It's awesome. It's, it's up to the owner. Thanks to everyone for coming tonight. It's yeah. very cool. Welcome Mark back. James. God bless you. Now, does, does anybody have anything they want to say? Any comments about the season or the drivers or whatever? Anybody? I hope I'm not the only one that says something. Mark, there ought to be somebody who's got an opinion about something. Well, I guess not. Oh well, it must be. It must be they want to eat, or they're just finishing into it. Oh, that's it. I got to talk. Thanks for coming out. Uh, as I said, I had a lot of people said, "When are you going to get back?" Well, we're not back, but we're here tonight. What'll happen coming forward? I have no idea, but we'll find out. And I will email and text, or not text, but uh, put on Facebook what goes on from here. And hopefully, you'll follow it. And we get back going. Who knows? Until the next time, whenever that is, Don K saying, thanks for being, thanks for watching, listening. See you next time. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.